Okay, Ruler, settle down. Ruler School is brought to you by Odyssey Games, where you can go to get pre-orders of all the upcoming Force of Will sets, as well as releases of previous sets after they come out. CCGprime.com, with over 100,000 Force of Will singles, as well as out-of-print boxes from the past, and TCG accessories, as well as FowlLibrary.com, a wonderful resource for deck lists, article discussions, and more. Check them out at FowlLibrary.com, as well as these amazing patrons. Special thanks to guest lecturer member, Vite Raman. Thank you for your support. Class is in session. Hey, the Rulers, Demo73 here, bringing you a Wanderer feature match for the week. Looking forward to getting into this. But before we do, keep in mind that the new set, Game of Gods, the first set of Dual Cluster, is about to come out and is currently available for pre-order through Odyssey Games. They have pre-orders of the starter decks, regular boxes and pre-release kits so go check them out and after release you can still get boxes there or you can get singles over at ccgprime.com so whatever the way you want to get the product for the new set we have it for you we are jumping in here with a very fun matchup this is josh mostart aka the bardiest bard uh playing zalus palace with almerius and moochtart versus paul who is playing El Dorado with the wonderful Lumia. So play some El Dorado flicker shenanigans. So we're in for a hoot and a half here. Looking forward to seeing exactly what these two decks can do, whether it's a million gems or a million different uh, typings so that you have things that are gigantic because of Diversity Palace. So we're going to go ahead and dig right in. Now, for those of you who don't know, the main thing about Zalus Palace is the combination of um, Kingdom of Diversity Light Palace uh, says that every one of your creatures gets plus 100, plus 100 for every different race you control, and Zeus Alice uh, is all races in all zones. So when she is on the field and you have Zalus Palace, or Diversity Palace, all of your guys get, uh, I think it's 25,600 additional attack and defense. So it's just suddenly anything that connects is lethal. And obviously the Lumia deck is trying to do flicker shenanigans to make use of Eldorado's immense amount of value that he generates every single time he enters to just flicker this over and over again to have a bunch of gems to be able to control the board that way. Starting out with a flute, a great little ramp card that has barriers so it's going to be able to stay safe. The beauty of Lumia decks is that you can use your ramp and then flicker it to still have the will during your opponent's turn. Uh, Josh says, that's a great card. I think I'll play that too. So we're off to a very good start with both of these decks kind of being able to ramp into their end game conditions. Before recovery, looks like we're going to get a Dark Alice Rabbit Princess to help with some draw power here. Also serves as a nice protection, just in case there is happens to be any kind of um, reanimate in the deck for Paul or any kind of like graveyard control from uh, Josh. See a uh, Hunting Angel get discarded. And then choosing to banish the Dark Alice to keep that card advantage up. Going to recovery here. Interesting choice to banish the Dark Alice. I think she's kind of always better on the field, especially since you can like flicker her with Lumia for more drop power. But maybe what's in hand is just better here. We're going to use Flute to cast a Flute. And then that Flute's going to get recovered thanks to Lumia. Oh, but Josh says, once again, that was a great move. I think I will also do it, which makes sense because he wants to get some cards in the grave because of the Almerius that he's going to be using here. And in response to the flicker from Lumia, while we're still kind of having to use that will, we're going to dump two uh, Diversity Kingdoms to the graveyard with that Dark Alice. Calling our second stone here, we hit another Gusting Skies. This is this is like the most old school foul feeling match I've watched in a long time with both players just taking the exact same moves to ramp up so that we can actually start taking actions on turn four and five. Um, it feels very great. I don't know, I'm, I'm a fan of it. Do we see you do have that Eldorado here? The question is, is there going to be a way for Josh to be able to stop it? He does have that green um, will, so there's potential for a last lecture. But if this resolves, we're going to start getting a lot of value off of it. Down comes the Eldorado Pearl Shine. Do we see something to stop it? Yes, there is the last lecture. Uh, it still puts it back in his hand, so this is not great for Josh because he's still going to have to try to deal with the Eldorado next turn. But, I mean, he the longer he can keep it controlled, the better. At 
this is one of the reasons why I'm very much looking forward to the new order rulers because things like El Dorado you can order to summon them. Uh, so like we don't have to worry about cancels and then suddenly they hit the field and just start generating this massive pressure. So I'm very excited for that. We've used El Dorado in the cube and he is absolutely a boss monster. Once again, we're going to get a nice little flicker off of the Lumia. Still in the end phase, in response to that flicker, we're going to get another Dark Alice coming down here for Josh. So both players really sculpting their hands here, just trying to set up their combo. Oh, we see that Zeus Alice go to the graveyard. And then choosing the banish the other Dark Alice. So going into Josh's turn, I mean, obviously what he wants to try to do is like... It, based on how many other potential threats Paul's playing in the board, if the game plan is just, you know, stick El Dorado to win, um, then taking it a little bit slower from Josh and not trying to push through uh, is certainly the better option here to always set up a moment where, like, you force Paul to be able to um, kind of tap out to get to his win condition, you punish that, and then you kind of push back and crack back through, especially since Josh um, is kind of a, I don't want to say like a one-hit KO deck, but like that's the whole idea of it is like you want to be able to get out Diversity Palace and kind of punch through because you have you have so many Resonators, right? So the more the Resonators that stick, the better. You just need Zeus, Alice, and Diversity Palace. Down comes Campanella, and in response we see an Exorcist Mage. So Campanella is great because you get to a Water Moon card from your deck, and because Zeus Alice is all races in all zones and has the Water attribute, she is a Water Moon card. Um, so you can grab it with Campanella. Thankfully, though, Paul did have the uh, Exorcist Mage here to be able to stop, uh, get the RF, you know, prevent that from coming into play. We do see another last lecture here, but we still have a flute available. So this last lecture feels a little bit odd. It's going to put the Exorcist Mage back in his hand, and then he can recast it, which will tap him out, but there's really not much that Josh is going to be able to do against that. Uh, and now we're kind of setting ourselves up to be El Dorado'd. Um, which is suboptimal. The one thing about Exorcist Mage, though, is it does kind of prevent uh, Lumia flickers, uh, or at least like the thing will just get permanently RFG'd, so Paul does have to be really careful here. So like I said, the the, the last lecture kind of gets bounced back. Um, Josh could choose to fail to find. Ultimately, though, he's going to stick to it. He's going to say, you know what, I'm going to thin my deck a little bit and RFG a Zeus Alice. Um, which is also an interesting choice. I wonder if Josh is playing any kind of get things back from the RFG cards. So with Josh tapped out of any kind of color outside of white, we pretty much have free game this next turn to be able to slam the Eldorado and really start getting value off of it, which is going to be awesome. One of the big things about this matchup that makes Eldorado so good here is because of the fact that every time he flickers, he gets a light gem, and a light gem can be used to pop an addition, which means that every single time that Diversity Palace hits the board, it's just going to get destroyed. Um, so that's going to be the way that Paul really kind of keeps the game on lock once Eldorado hits the field. That being said, he has to get one onto the field and hope that there's no removal for it. Um, sticking two Eldorados, obviously, then you're just in really good shape, and you just need to keep generating those light crystals, or light gems. Um, keeping in mind that Eldorado will generate one of every single gem type every single time he enters the field. Um, so there's a lot of value to be gained there. Down comes the Eldorado. Like I said, we don't really have a response from Josh because he just has access to white. So Eldorado is going to get to generate him a fire gem, a light gem, a darkness gem, a water gem, and a wind gem. And he has five different activate abilities all by banishing a gem. A wind gem lets him produce one will of any color, which is huge. White gem lets him pop an addition. Black gem forces your opponent to discard at instant speed, mind you. Blue gem draws you a card, and red gem can be used to burn anything or your um, for 500 life. So we're going to quickly just say, hey, discard a card right now out of the bat. Uh, get sort of a Campanella that makes sense. He doesn't have to worry about the... Um, with the Exorcist means a Campanella's not going to do much. And then he can automatically replace itself with uh, Lumia. Now, things like Yggdrasil's Grace are super huge here. Like, one-cost flicker cards are really, really cool for Eldorado because, like, he produces the will to be able to flicker, um, which is pretty awesome. Um, one of the things that we're looking at before uh, is, like, to use with the new Odin is to use the Eldorado to produce black to play Suya to then have to banish your Eldorado so you can resummon it again the next turn. Um, and you can see 
see here just like the massive amount of value that just even landing an Eldorado is going to get him here. He's going to banish the red gem to burn his own exorcist mage, which feels great since a Campanella just got discarded. Uh, and then we're going to use the flute to pay for this road to the sacred queen, which will then get flickered. So this is great for Paul because now if things are coming into play tapped, we open up things like Schrodinger's Cry, which we have white for. It's like the best removal for white in the game um, in the Wanderer format and things of that nature. Um, we still have green to be able to produce any color will that we want. We're also not dealing with aggression. Um, and one of the things that's big deal about Zalus Palace when you're playing it not as Adam is it's a lot harder to give her all of those simple skills. She's pretty much just there to turn on Diversity Palace. So keeping her to play tap, like one less body that you have to deal with or keeping her tapped so that you can RFG her feels really, really great. Both players sitting on a ton of will here. Hitting another six sage stone. We're gonna go ahead and say, hey, you know what? You uh you got rid of the exorcist mage here, so we're gonna take advantage and do judgment of Almerius. Almerius is going to get to be able to grab him. Um something back from the graveyard he's going to grab that zalus which is going to come into play tapped ultimately seeing whether or not paul has a response paul says no that's fine your your zalus gonna enter that's that field that's no big deal so now we have this body here it's mostly just like i said providing that ability of this uh, card gains all races in all zones so that we can turn on a diversity palace now keep in mind here uh, if we do play a Diversity Palace here, it feels pretty bad, unless we have some way like a Lorite to be able to stop the Eldorado effect, um, because that's just going to get popped as soon as we go for attack. Um, yeah, exactly like this. We're just going to go ahead and there's the Lorite to stop it. So, and then Dispelling Stone to still destroy it off of Paul because we tapped out a green we don't have any way to be able to play play it any kind of cancel here um unfortunately just tapped a little bit wrong to be able to keep that safe because we do have the potential if we had a green we could cancel it but dispelling stone is going to get the job done um and we get to pop that diversity palace this leaves uh joshua just one card in hand at this point um so if we can get the um get the Eldorado flickered, we're in pretty good shape. We're going to go ahead and Schrodinger's Cry, like I said, because we can get that Zeus Alice into play tapped, having Schrodinger's Cry is available as soon as an Eresneeter comes into field is awesome. Now another Diversity Palace, um, now another Zalus is completely removed, and we're just keeping those combo pieces locked out for Josh. Swinging in for 13. Eldorado is very large and in charge. Choosing to block with the Dark Alice and then while it's in the graveyard, banishing the Campanella and, you know, to kind of be able to uh, bring the Dark Alice back to his hand instead. Another nice little effect of Campanella here. See, we do have a second Eldorado. Choosing whether or not to use it here. Go, and go ahead and go for it. He's casting a second Eldorado here. Says, look, if one Eldorado is great, two Eldorados is better. Um, now, if one gets destroyed, you still have the other one to be able to activate the effects, which I think is the biggest part here. Forcing the discard as soon as it comes into play. We're going to go ahead and see a response of flashing in the Dark Alice. We get to draw, discard, draw, discard. I imagine we probably see a Lorite banish here to be able to keep up the card advantage. Yep, that makes sense. One thing that we missed here is he forgot to draw a card off of Mood Start when Almerius Judgmented. So that could have had an impact here, um, but it is kind of an optional trigger. Uh, so, or it's a mandatory trigger, but like game state wise, you can't really go back at this point. Keeping that hand full, playing a third flute. Uh, I don't really agree with playing the third flute here. There's not really much we're going to be using the will for. And keeping the option of Funnel of Stars 
to be able to have a board wipe if necessary, uh, especially since we can start using our flutes to put plus one, plus one counters on things. Um, feels a little off. At the end of the turn, we're gonna go ahead and get to get another Pearl Shine out here. We're up to three possible floating mill. Like I said, we have so much will here because of the Eldorados with their wind gems. I'm not really sure how needed that is. Forcing him to discard another card. See, we discard that number 13. Number 13 is really not going to do much in this position, especially since the Eldorados have actually hit board. Putting a plus one, plus one counter on the Elmarius. In response, he's just going to double burn the Elmarius um, with the Eldorados effect. So it's just saying, nope, you know, make you waste that. Let's keep that dead, especially since Paul doesn't have any flyers. That kind of makes sense. Just one less thing to have to worry about damage wise. Now we can just start calling with impunity, calling stone with Almarius as much as we want. We see a hard cast Zeus Alice. It's gonna come into play tapped. Um, which feels a little weird. Um, if we have a way to get another Light Palace from the graveyard back, it would be great. Oh, and we topped, the other card we top decked here was a Duet of Light. So that is going to get to gain him 2,000 life, and he's choosing the mode, I think, to grab an entity from the graveyard. Uh, and it's any entity costs three or less, so he can actually use this to grab Diversity Palace. That being said, he still has to do with two pops of the additions from Tigris and he doesn't have any cards in hand so it's going to die um, but I think that there is a, a sequence of events in terms of how, when you decide to pop it based on what Josh does here so like if he just passes turn then you just let it the pop here happen but he's gonna go ahead and respond by uh, into the attack from a flute by popping it so he'll take two damage from that plus uh, flute with a plus one plus one counter on it leaving Josh with a grand total of um, one will available uh, to deal with this massive wall of will that uh, Paul will be dealing with. Down comes another Dark Alice here. See another Road to the Sacred Queen get pitched. Don't really need more than one of those. And then once again, choosing to banish the Dark Alice. Drawing another card off of the Blue Gem. Swinging his Eldorado into the Zeus Alice. Says that's fine. Swinging 13 to face. Slow, so begins the slow grind of whittling down a 9,000 life point on Marius deck to zero. But Paul's in pretty good control here. Full grip of cards. He's going to get to be able to flicker um, at least one Tagris every single turn. If we see things like Dreams of Juliet or Yggdrasil's Grace come out of the deck, these are both things to be able to flicker more than once per turn. Oh, we're going to go ahead and see a Judgment of the Lumia. And he does have the Nyarlathotep in hand to give it Imperishable and Drain. It's pretty impressive. So now whenever that Lumia attacks, he gets to flicker something into play Rested. So he'll get to flicker the... Uh, Tigris proactively a little bit more. While also generating some life and dealing some more damage. Feels pretty good to be able to control the board. Now we have that instant speed discard that really just kind of locks, you know, we, we've seen it from Electo loops. Um, now you can just see it with Eldorado. <laughs> Before recovery, we're going to go ahead and force a discard here. It's 
seeing if Josh thinks this is one, a quick cast start, and B, worth trying to save. Ultimately, no, we lose a flute. So if I'm Josh's shoes here, trying to find any kind of way to be able to draw cards is the big one. Uh, and the easiest way it would seem to do that is by flipping over mood start, um, at least for now. The problem being that once again, we have Pearl Shine who can answer J rulers, um, but it's still kind of worth it. Now you'll notice that uh, they kind of walk through here uh, Josh drawing a card because they're talking about whether or not Moodshark can draw and then catching that Almerius forgot to draw earlier. Um, so they draw up so that Josh has the one card here, but keep in mind that Moodshark does not see herself draw a card when she judgments. It's only when her partner judgments that she will draw a card. Um, just an important thing for people to be aware of because of kind of when, when, the, ability, when the ability happens. Couldn't quite tell what that card was. Maybe another duet of light. It's not going to do too much right now. Other than potentially gain him some more life. the end of Josh's turn, we're going to see a flickered in Charlotte, and then using the flute to pay one, we're going to cast a Blessing of Yggdrasil from the sideboard. Okay, so this is how we're getting that extra flicker in. So what this is going to do is, as he's moving into the end phase, uh, Blessings of Yggdrasil is going to flicker the Eldorado back, uh, and then during the end phase of Josh's turn, that Eldorado gets to come back into play because it's at the next end of turn. So suddenly we get to generate all these resources and then we can go ahead and still force him to discard a card even before we go to our turn. And keeping him at zero cards means that Mood Start's not gonna be able to do much damage anyway, at least until she gets some plus one, plus one counters on her. Paul's side of the field encroaching onto Josh's side here with his massive army. Swinging in for 13 with an Eldorado. We say no blocks. Swinging in for a 13 with another Eldorado. We say no blocks. Down to 51. Swinging in the air for 6. It says no blocks. Down to 45. And then finally, Lumi is going to probably swing in here, flickering the Eldorado and swinging in for 10. Anytime Josh wants to draw a card, that's just not going to happen. Which is interesting to see the Mood Start deck not be the one with card advantage. Um, because Paul just has a massive grip of cards here. It's a five extra floating wheel potentially. Um, and choosing to play an Acolyte of the Sun might be playing a few too many ramp cards in this Lumia deck and not enough threats. But um, certainly interesting to see just exactly how much will we're going to be playing. Hopefully we have some kind of will sync maybe in the deck list. But I'd be curious to see what that looked like. Draws, forces the discard before recovery. Unfortunately, it's not quick cast, so that card's just going to go away. Mood start with that plus one, plus one counter, and no flyers to speak of. So if it gets to connect, he'll get, Josh will get to finally draw a card here. 
whether or not it is allowed to connect because of the three fires gems, who knows. Paul says, yeah, I'll take one. And Josh is ecstatic because now it means he gets to draw a card. So we can at least try to do something here if it's a card that's worth playing. Ultimately, though, it doesn't seem like it was something that was worth the time. Uh, or if it is, it's a quick cast card we're going to hold on to until J Paul tries to waste a darkness gem. Which would make a lot of sense. The problem is we're staring down a rather large board. I mean, it's 26, 32, 42 damage represented every turn. Um, and it's only going to get bigger from there. I mean, that is lethal represented right now. And currently his mood shirt is blocked and all he has is a flute. Going after the mood dart. An interesting choice other than just going after the lethal. Chooses to block with the flute. Pause that's that's fine. As he moves into combat again, we see Josh try to do uh last lecture here to try to recover the mood start so it doesn't get attacked last lecture can't recover a j ruler it can only recover a ruler so they catch that and unfortunately um he's got to go backwards here um that means that once again this is what i was saying before like cancels once the eldorado hits board don't really do much um because really we're just going to flicker the eldorado over and over again and outvalue you that way um so we're just going to go ahead and go face um with the uh Lumia and the other Eldorado say, look, you can have your, um, you can have your thing. And then uh, Josh just decides it. Like, there's nothing I can do here. Let's scoop it up and let's go to the next game. So obviously the game plan here is to keep Eldorado off the board, uh, as the jo as Josh, uh, because once he gets on board, it gets a little bit insane. Um, especially, uh, the only kind of way to kind of at least some semi prevent it once it gets onto the board is to try to lorite the initial trigger to generate gems um, but once gems hit the field you generate so much value off of an eldorado and then it just keeps happening over and over again coming down here for josh we see a first turn callstone pass down comes a flute and a very quick last lecture to put that flute back in his hand um feels very weird especially since your opponent has energized to use the last lecture here so proactively um especially since we're probably going to pop energize to play that flute just turn one um temporary mana into permanent will like sorry one temporary will into permanent will um that we can kind of reuse over and over again thanks to the the flicker um but maybe the thought is at least i make you burn energize now as opposed to being able to potentially play a turn two el dorado before i'm ready See a light vapors come down here for Josh. And once again, just a pass. Does have the will to be able to jam a cancel if he needs to. Paul does have to be careful there. And a pass from Paul as well. Like I said, feels very much like 2016. Um... 2014 to 2016 force will down comes that dark alice rabbit princess do some hand sculpting probably going to send a diversity palette to the grave so we can grab it later ultimately choosing to send a campanella and there's that light palace yep so just saying i'll, I'll grab i'll put i'll grab these later i don't i don't need these right now we'll, we'll put these right here And then using mood start to do some filtering. Come 
calling a stone with Almarius. Let's just have a. So this is the reason. This is one of the things of like in Wanderer with six age stone that's really weird with the tap effects is that I, that I've used. It doesn't really necessarily matter for Paul's deck because he's not seemingly running green. But like in response to the six age stone trigger, when they go to tap their ruler, um, you can lowerite the six age trigger so that the, both of their things will be tapped. So then six age stone is just a void stone. It, it certainly is pretty devastating when it happens if you're not prepared for it. And so it's kind of you gotta be mindful there. It's a good trick in Wanderer if you're really trying to help kind of curb tag a little bit. Staring down a green-white control deck does not make sense to try to jam an Eldorado on four and tap out. Um, so Paul makes the better call there and just kind of waits. question is is Josh going to do anything here other than call stone and set himself up to play like a control deck until he's ready to pop off end of the turn we're gonna see a Charlotte we're gonna see a Lorite to cancel the answer effects it, this is an interesting choice here I don't really know what when the chase was already empty, we were going to use the Charlotte for. Um, other than, yeah, I don't, I don't really know what we would have used that for, to be honest. Um, going to Archer, we get to hit him for six. Because then the other thing is, you know, you use the now you've used the Lorite to to be able to not stop an Eldorado. So even if it does hit the field, yeah, it feels pretty bad. Paul's deck definitely showed, at least in game one, that its real big threat was Eldorado. Uh, didn't really have much to, to it outside of that, at least from what we saw. Um, so I'd be curious to see what other threats were in there. Doing what you're not supposed to be doing and looking through your sideboard during a match. But it's for the sake of the recording, figuring out whether or not he wants to go ahead and try to flash in a Charlotte. Ultimately just choosing to pass uh, and then doing some filtering here. Like I said, not really too much when the chase is empty other than just putting a body on field that playing a Charlotte would do. Did see a number 13 there, which is now only going to cost one will. And we do have a lot of green white sources or a lot of green sources for the one will cost of number 13. Realizing he forgot to flicker not really having anything to use that he wants to use the Charlotte effect for. So it is this kind of guessing game, right? Paul has to think of, hey, do I think that there's cancels in that hand that's going to deal with my Eldorado? Is it worth trying to push it? And if I am pushing it, how badly do I get punished if it falls through? The problem is that now we're getting to the point with number 13's only costing one on top of Lorites is will efficiency starts to kind of plummet now that we don't have, you know, the multiple flutes, now that we don't have Messenger of the Sun, which is we haven't stuck a single uh, Eldorado as of yet. So Paul getting that second flute here, Hopefully seeing if he can kind of set up something, but he is kind of a little bit behind. We swing in with the Charlotte. Josh playing a Charlotte of his own. This is probably going to hit something like a Schrodinger's Cry to get rid of that Charlotte, I imagine, um, just to get it out of the out of the way. Yep, down comes the Schrodinger's Cry. Just get that out of here so we don't have to worry about it anymore. 
Don't know if there's anything Paul has that can respond to this unless he is playing some Yggdrasil's Graces in the main. I think that's one of the things that I, I am a little curious about in looking at Paul's list as to whether or not we have any flicker options in the main outside of Lumia herself. Um, the deck seems to have a lot of removal, but not unnecessary lot of protection um, would be something I would think that you would kind of want to see coming into play here. So Josh is at a good spot. Um, he's at a good spot to be able to probably start pushing towards his combo here. He's pretty controlled. We don't have any Eldorados on field. We have a lot of, it would seem we have a lot of ways to stop Eldorado as well. And plus having three bodies on board, including a flyer, means that we probably have a way to be able to push through lethal from at least one of these swings, considering um, Paul only has two blockers on field. We just got to find our pieces to be able to hit the uh, Zeus Alice and the uh, um, Diversity uh, Palace. Looks like I see at least one of those in his hand, potentially, if not a Campanella, to be able to go grab it. Um, we don't have, I mean, we've got a good spread of resources here, so lots of different options available. And the graveyard is currently protected. Also having a Marius here to be able to grab, um, to be able to grab what he needs is pretty big here. Duet of Light's gonna come down seemingly to grab probably Campanella, um, especially if there's a diversity in hand. Um, so we'll have to see. Yep, gonna grab the Campanella here. Do we see an Exorcist Mage out of Paul? That's the big trick here. If there is an Exorcist Mage, we have so much will that like, unless it's a hard counter, you feel pretty confident about being able to resolve it. Um, but nope, ultimately we're, that's gonna go through and comes the Zeus Alice. All it's doing is sitting there to get in all those races again. It's never gonna have a way to get those symbol skills. One more will up, and it could have its five will option because it um, it gets the five will option regardless. Um, down comes a hard cast diversity palace from hand. So now uh, Charlotte, Dark Alice, and uh, Lorite all have like plus twenty five thousand attack and defense, um, which is a lot. <laughs> Uh, and um, they won't have any of the, they all have flying. That's the other thing too, is they all suddenly have flying. Down comes a Dispelling Stone to try to pop it. We see the number 13 here. So attempted options. Um, trying to pay two more. We see a attempted, oh, interdimensional escape to try to force him to banish down to one thing, which would save us life. Uh, but ultimately, we do have another number 13 here. Schrodinger's Cry. Um, this at least gets rid of the Charlotte to stop everything from having flying. Uh, but we need two more removal sources, and we only have one more will. Um, so we're a little bit out of luck. So the Dark Alice here, whether or not that's going to get removed, even if it is, the Lorite can punch through for 25,000 damage. And that will be the lethal. Do have the Hunting Angel there to kill the Dark Alice, but ultimately not enough, and so we're gonna move into game three. So, Paul, obviously, I think this time trying to get into an El Dorado a lot quicker. I think one of the big things that kind of fell apart in game two um, was just not having ways to try to push through the cancels while also leaving up Will. Uh, and I will say that, unfortunately, not having ways to bring El Dorado back, seemingly uh, at least like back to his hands through things like relief aid or something like that could have been really beneficial. But ultimately, um, the cancels really just got him there. Down comes the turn one flute, flute into what seems to be a second flute and really going aggressive here with an acolyte of the sun just saying look i'm gonna go into my next turn i'm gonna have six will available so i have eldorado plus a backup um that being said i mean if you've got things like you know uh, let no ways to like prevent him from being bounced like your opponent's still gonna get kind of some value out of there but it at least let paul be a little bit more protected when he's trying to jam the eldorados Choosing to pass the turn, down comes the Charlotte. 
And now this seems weird here. He uses the Lorite to stop the effect of the Charlotte. I don't really know if there's a reason to do there. I don't know what one drop light card we would want to play there. Um, and now he's like tapped out at least um, to the point of like he can use last lecture here, which puts it back in his hand, which still feels like fine. But like that felt really weird. Like I don't really know what we were benefiting there other than just like putting a little piddly body on board so that we, if we can hit the Zeus Alice Palace early, we have an aggressor. Um, ultimately get to swing into the air for six there and then we do get to flicker the uh, Charlotte, but I think he misses that. Draw's feeling very pressured, I imagine, because next turn Paul's going to get to seven will. Um, really needs to find an actual hard to cancel for the Eldorado instead of just putting it back in his hand. Because if we had access to even one more will going into next turn, Paul would be able to play through a last lecture and double cast Eldorado, um, which is pretty huge. We see he at least has one. Hopefully he gets a second one soon, or at least has finds a way to draw into a second one soon. Do we see another Charlotte come down into play here? Nope, we're just gonna see a pump up of the Charlotte. Down comes the Eldorado attempted again. Does this resolve? Do we have that hard counter or do we have to deal with a potential Lorite. Lorite's not terrible, but it's something that Paul definitely doesn't care about right now. Um, a hard cancel is the worst part here. Does have the number 13. We have to pay two for it. Um, now we're just, we need to look for a second one. Thankfully, he does have the Dispelling Stone um, to deal with the, um, to deal with the uh, Light Palace. Um, one thing that he could grab off the back uh, is he could grab, if he does get to flicker here, ultimately we see a slammed Lorite in response to the Lumia flicker. Um, so he could play false um, false life or false peace, um, which could then like draw him a card and gain him some life. Like that would be pretty good. Um, we, we need to dig a lot. We need like dark Alice's and stuff like that to really dig in here um, to be able to get to another Pearl Shine because that that's really gonna hold things together. Josh doing very well in the back foot here, um, keeping things you know at a pace, yeah, at a pace where he wants them to be playing, not letting Paul just kind of go nuts. Josh seemingly thinking whether or not he wants to just kind of continue to play this play pass game, maybe put on some pressure or try to dig for another resource if he doesn't have any cancels, maybe concerned about what we might see out of Paul's hand. Down comes an Altasing Secret Hideout. So I like this card in the sense that it gets to let him protect Zeus Alice half of the combo. And we see a Dispelling Stone here to pop it. Um, Makes sense to keep the addition on field so that our removal options can be used. You know, we have more avenues to be able to kill the Zeus Alice. Um, because, like, if you kill Zeus Alice while Palace is on field, or if you kill Palace while Zeus Alice is on field, either way, you lose kind of the pressure. Um, so, leaving your options open by Dispelling Stone there feels okay. Um, it does feel a little weird, though, because I probably would have preferred to have saved the Dispelling Stone for the Palace, uh, since we don't know when we're going to see that again, because now we have two cards that we're really wanting to dig for. In response to this Dark Alice cast, we're going to see a Charlotte come down here. I imagine this Charlotte, once again, is going to kill the other Charlotte um, with a Schrodinger's Cry, as we've seen before. Yep, that's exactly what's going to happen. This is one of the reasons why the Lumia, like preventing the Lumia flicker was pretty huge. Um, with that Lorite, it kind of paid off in dividends. 
choosing to sacrifice the interesting choice here to choose to sacrifice the acolyte of the sun if we do happen to get into a into a tigris here if we kept that acolyte of the sun we could have done cast el dorado judgment lumia immediately flicker the el dorado i mean we can still do it this way technically um but it costs the will from el dorado which you would probably prefer to save up for ultimately though we still need to see pearl shine like if we don't see pearl shine that play line doesn't matter um and it seems like we did not unfortunately so we're gonna probably end up seeing a and this is the reason why right we're now we're gonna try to flicker the um dark alice but if we had kept that acolyte of the sun instead of discard maybe a dead card like i don't really know why we're keeping on to that holding on to that seventh boon in our hand there's no god's arts there's stone tokens um like that feels like a card that we could have just pitched a long time ago um then we if we do happen to see an eldorado off of this uh dark alice flicker then we get to cast it we get to cast pearl shrine here although he does get to recover the stone uh because his judgment his ruler is a light ruler so that's that's not too bad we still have that resource available ultimately though still just not seeing uh eldorado probably four copies of the deck and just not seeing him unfortunately we are going to choose to go ahead and Schrodinger's Cry the Lorite. Um, that makes sense in the sense of just like keeping a body off board that can potentially swing. Only have one blocker here and two will available, um, a three will potentially available. So in a really good spot for Josh to be able to potentially pull off the combo this turn if he can find his pieces. That being said, we haven't seen um, anything go to the grave correctly. We haven't seen um, a Campanella or anything to be able to revive. So like. The ways that Josh finds the pieces have to be like exactly having it all in hand right now. And hopefully not having to deal with any kind of disruption. Does look like we have a Campanella in hand here. That's going to go get us potentially another the, the Zeus Alice. Do we have an Exorcist Mage in hand? Does not appear to be the case. Really unfortunate there. So here comes the Zeus Alice. The question becomes, do we have a Light Palace in hand? As it stands right now, we have more, we have three things that can attack, or two things that can attack, both have flying. So blockers don't really matter right now. Um, because Light Palace will give everything the simple skills of Charlotte, and she has flying. So, oh. A J ruler with that ability. Sorry, so no, they don't have flying. We do have a blocker at least. So in comes Charlotte trying to find the lethal. We see a cast Charlotte here randomly paying three, which doesn't make sense. You pay at resolution of her activate ability uh, or of her enter effect. Um, but ultimately we see a last lecture here uh, to put that back in his hand, but he still has the one will floating to be able to use Hunting Angel, which can kill it. The problem is, though, that he's out of blockers at this point, and Lorite can swing through for lethal. So that is the game. It was a ton of fun to be able to record this for you guys. Let us know if you want to see more Wanderer content, kind of what ideas you want to see there. We'll make them happen. And uh, keep us informed about what you want to see as we get ready for Dual Cluster. Check out Odyssey Games for your pre-orders and CCG Prime for singles. And until next time, this is DMO73 saying, Class Dismissed.